Hello, and welcome back to the channel. This is the Aberration series. We'll be starting today with Helena's notes. Before we jump in, I wanted to let you guys know that I'll be streaming some Aberration gameplay tonight at 10 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Don't worry if you miss it, um, I'm probably going to leave it up on the channel for a little bit, but it would be great if you could come in, it's a super fun time. As well as that, if you want some updates to videos, series, or streams, or anything like that, click the link to my Discord down below and join the community. Finally, I'm thinking about starting an Aberration playthrough during this series. Let me know if you guys would be interested in that below. But with that out of the way, let's jump into the notes. Enjoy, Survivor. Bloody hell, this place is weird. Don't get me wrong, it's fascinating too. Such an abundance of underground flora is completely unheard of. And because so many of the plants here are bioluminescent, the whole forest has an eerie beauty to it. That's just it though. Eerie is the operative word. I've been holding my rifle so tightly since we got here that I swear I've left dents in the grip. We should have gone back to the island. People know us there. They might have preferred help and supplies. Rockwell didn't want to hear it though, and I wasn't about to let him come here alone. You can't surprise me anymore, life, I said. After wyverns, golems, and giant sandworms, I'm ready for anything. What about flying squid bat murder monsters, life replied. Well, that is mildly surprising, I conceded. By which I mean I shot and cursed at those things all afternoon, at least when I wasn't running from them. Thankfully, after thinning their numbers a little, they decided that Rockwell and I weren't worth the trouble. Let's hope they don't change their minds. I'm not sure I have enough ammunition left to fend them off again. And yes, I know that FSBMM isn't the most scientific of monikers, but I'm bloody upset with them right now, so that's what I'm calling them, along with some other names I'd rather not write down. While I can't say I'm enamored with this station's wildlife, I'm certainly grateful for its abundance of natural resources, particularly water. The permeability of the rocks here is astounding. The cavern walls are wet with condensation, and the floor is littered with pools of water. After all that time in the desert, this is one change I can welcome with open arms. Thank God for hydration. I don't mean that just for my own sake, either. Rockwell seems distracted. The other day, I had to keep him from walking headlong into a poisonous mushroom. He wouldn't fare well in a harsher environment. Then again, at his age, I'm sure I'd lose a step too. There's no mistaking it, that was a giant armored mole rat. Thankfully, it wasn't aggressive, so I was able to get a good look at it. Its appearance made me realize something that I'd taken for granted. Every creature I've encountered has some basis on either a known species or human legend. Golems and wyverns never existed on Earth, but humans did write stories about them. Even the FSBMMs, still cross with them, appear to be a pastiche of known fauna. What does that mean? Are the curators of these stations human? Do they merely possess extensive knowledge of humans, or am I grasping at straws? I can't say, but it's worth pondering. The FSBMMs returned, and I was right. I didn't have the firepower to fight them. Luckily, someone else did. It was incredible. I've never seen a human move so fast. One second, I'm a dead woman, and the next there's someone in glowing silver armor tearing through those creatures like they were dodos. One got punched so hard it skipped off the cavern floor. As if a superhuman savior wasn't shocking enough, when they lifted their visor, I found a familiar face. It was Mei Yin. It took me a good minute to form a sentence after that. I must have looked like a complete dipstick, because I swear she almost laughed. At least I'm a living dipstick, and with her around, I just might stay that way. What's the saying? Absence makes the heart grow fonder? On the island, I wasn't sure where I stood with Mei Yin, but now we've been catching up like best mates. She apologized for socking me in the face. I learned how she arrived here, and that she got her new scar while battling Nerva to the death. You know, best mate things. She also introduced us to some of her new allies at her camp. And here's where it gets loony. They're from the future. Well, my future, anyway. It all fits, doesn't it? I never met anyone from my future before. But Mei Yin and Rockwell are from my past, and the technology here is beyond anything from my present. 
Clearly, the current year is far beyond 2008, but by how much? The journey to the village was a bit tricky. Since Rockwell and I lacked the high-tech armor the others wear, they had to help us along with rope ladders and zip lines. We made it eventually, though, and it's quite the sight. The technology this tribe uses is incredible, although Rockwell was far more intrigued by it than I was. Mei-Yin's friend, Diana, gave us the grand tour, and he pelted her with questions the whole time. Fortunately, Diana just smiled and answered his questions patiently. Apparently, she was a pilot in her own time, which is the same era her fellow villagers are from. That there are so many people from one time period on one station seems unusual. I wonder what it means. I have to convince them to stop. There's no way the station will allow this. This place would never allow anyone to master it. If it weren't for Raya's warning, I'd be ecstatic about what they were creating. A gateway that can help us escape the station and reach the planet below? It's brilliant, but the obelisks will kill everyone here before we can complete it. Just like they destroyed the village Raya told me about. I'm sure of it. Bloody hell. I'm going to look like an absolute madwoman. I've barely settled in here and I'm already coming to them with doomsday prophecies. I'll need to convince Mei Yin and Diana first. They're my best bet. The tribe's leadership was surprisingly receptive to my ideas, but still a bit skeptical. Apparently, they've already fiddled with one of the obelisks, and even damaged this station's control center. So while they believe my account of what happened in the desert, they think the threat is already contained. Thankfully, Diana convinced them to lend me a small team to inspect the obelisk just in case. But better than nothing, at least. However, on this station, getting to an obelisk is something of a risky proposition. To reach them, we'll need to make a trip to the surface, which even Mei Yin says is dangerous. That means before I go, I'll need to get a crash course on that armor. My time in the desert may have given me some skill with firearms and helped me get fit, despite failing to give me washboard abs, much to my chagrin. But I'm no soldier. That was evident to anyone who saw me flailing around in the training yard these past few days. If it weren't for Mei Yin and Diana, I'd still be crashing my tech armor into rocks or tripping over myself like a drunken dodo. Plus, I always feel less silly when there's someone to laugh at my mistakes along with me. Fortunately, Mei Yin will be accompanying me to the obelisks so this whole thing won't rest in my unsteady, armored hands. Thank God. Mei Yin and I set out yesterday, alongside a bespectacled computer expert named Santiago. He'll be the one to actually examine the obelisk. He claims that he can hack into its terminal. If it's preparing to unleash a surge of power, as I suspect, then he says that he might be able to reroute it. Rockwell, for his part, is staying behind, He's been aiding the village's scientists in their studies since we arrived, and has become rather… engrossed. Every other sentence with him is about the bloody metal he named after himself. It's a bit troubling, but thankfully Diana said she'd look after him. I can't spend time worrying after Rockwell now, though. The fate of that whole village might depend on this expedition. Focus up, Helena. Let's do this. The structure of this space station must be vastly different from the others to allow for these massive caverns. Is that uncommon, or do many of the stations vary so radically from one another? I've only seen three. For all I know, they could come in all shapes and sizes. Speaking of different, Mei Yin's been fairly talkative since we left. At least for her. She'll still grow quiet sometimes, but instead of trying to burn me to death with invisible eye lasers, she stares into the distance and idly fiddles with her necklace. I think it depicts a plane or spaceship of some kind. I wonder where she got it. They weren't exaggerating when they said the surface was dangerous. Direct exposure to sunlight during the day will quickly burn a human to a crisp, even in this fancy armor. That means we have to adjust our sleep schedules and wait just below the surface until night falls. When it does, we'll make a mad dash for the obelisk, let Santiago get in as much work as he dares, then run our asses back to safety. It's truth, I thought that bloody desert was diabolical, but this tops it for sure. Why couldn't we do something simple, 
like flee from a pack of ravenous Allosaurus or something. This life I lead, I swear. Santiago's still going over his readings from last night, but even without them, it seems clear that the obelisk was behaving oddly. It was pulsing wildly and the ground beneath it received regular tremors, as if the whole station was on the verge of tearing itself apart. If the obelisk goes off, it could mean Armageddon for every living thing here. Despite this, Santiago is insisting on analyzing his readings. The scientist in me is proud of his dedication to hard evidence, but the part of me that would rather not be obliterated by a mysterious high-tech space station really wishes he would hurry the hell up. We shared our findings with the village by radio. Santiago's analysis confirmed what I suspected. The obelisks are highly unstable. They could be days away from reacting. However, Santiago raised a good point. Even if the Gateway Project is shut down, we can't say for sure that it would stabilize the obelisks. It may be too late to dissuade the station from destroying the village. The only way to ensure our survival is to shut down the obelisks themselves. According to Santiago, we can't do that from the obelisk's platforms, but he may be able to manipulate said platforms into teleporting us somewhere we could. Specifically, into the heart of the station itself. It's a huge risk, but it may be the only hope we have. <laughs>